So thank you all very much once again for coming to uh, UCC and uh, I very much hope that some of you at least will be near a TV at five o'clock this afternoon um, to see a certain match. I think it's five um, and we'll see what happens then. Right, so what I'm going to do now is to talk um, about uh, uses of astronomy in trying to um, encourage uh, interest in, of students in, um, in the physical sciences and I guess physics in particular. Um, what I've, the talk will focus on just three topics in astronomy and how leaving cert physics, relatively simple physics, can be used to actually um, get the fundamental message across to the students and the physics across to the students. But anyway, to begin, astronomy of course um, of all the sciences is arguably the one that has the strongest pull on the imagination of the public and of students at large. Um, probably the main reason for it, maybe there are two. The first is the nature of the questions it can address, the most fundamental issues really that you could imagine science addressing. Um, you know, is our universe, what's the state of our universe? Did it have a beginning? Is it going to have an end? Um, is there, you know, life on planets um, other than the Earth? What evidence do we have for planets orbiting other stars, for example? Do black holes exist? If so, where are they? How can we find out about the physics involved in them, etc.? I suppose that's one reason, the, the kind of questions that astronomy can address. And the other is that we're very lucky as a science in that we can make lots of pretty pictures. We can make things that make astronomy seem visually very attractive in a way that maybe other, many other areas of science don't quite have. And this is something that we try to use uh, in as much as possible. From a historical point of view too, astronomy is probably the first example of the successful application of the scientific method and of mathematics indeed to getting a genuinely new and fundamental understanding of what was happening, of how the physical world works. Um, the observations of, of Tycho Brahe, for example, and this whole puzzle of trying to understand the position of the motion of the planets in the sky led to Kepler's laws, which was really, they were really the first kind of proper application of mathematics um, in a detailed way to the physical universe. And so astronomy plays a very important role in the whole development of, of science as well. But here, for this talk, as I said, I'm just going to cover three particular topics in the context of leaving cert physics, just to give you a flavor for the kind of things you can go back and uh, tell your students about. The first is this idea of parallax, um, which is a very simple <coughs> concept, as, as you all know, but it turns out to be one of fundamental importance to uh, astronomy generally. Um, even the Greeks, when they were trying to figure out what the kind of general structure of the cosmos would be, to them, it seemed like a sensible thing to put the, the Earth um, at the very center of the universe. Um, uh, but even they were aware of the importance of parallax. And some of them thought, well, suppose maybe you might think of putting um, the sun in the middle. But if that was true, then the Earth might be going around the sun. And if that was the case, we should be able to see <coughs> parallax. Now, in this particular case, if you imagine the Earth-Sun system here, uh, here's a, a nearby star which we can see against the background of more distant stars. And so the idea is very simple. Let's say in the summer, you look at the star and you see this star against this particular region of background stars. And then later on in the year, the Earth moves around by um, six months and the position of the star appears to have changed by no other reason, just because of parallax. The Greeks thought, well, if that was true, you should be able to see that parallax. But of course, nobody could see that parallax. And so it was one of the reasons why they were quite happy to kind of stick with this particular system um, for as long as they did. Um, but of course, we now know that this really is the situation. And the problem is that this parallax, although it's there, is actually very hard to measure. The actual angular scale of parallax is typically only of the order of about one arc second. Um, which unfortunately is impossible to do with the to um, to see with the naked eye. <clears throat> the naked eye really has an angular kind of imaging capability of several tens, maybe twenty or thirty arc seconds or so. And so parallax is impossible to see with the naked eye, which is why even such a great astronomer as Tycho Brahe, the last of the great naked eye astronomers, couldn't see parallax, even though he intrinsically really felt that it should be there. And it was only with the invention of the telescope, and indeed, 
um, quite a bit after the initial invention of the telescope, that parallax was finally measured. And the wonderful thing about the measurement of parallax, and I'm going to go back to my diagram here, even in the context of relatively nearby stars, because obviously the nearer the star is, the greater the parallax is, and so the easier it is to measure, is that if you have this angle, of course, and you know the distance of the Earth from the Sun, it's one astronomical unit, and we know it fairly accurately, then simple trigonometry will give you the distance of the star from the Sun. And it turns out that for a very long time in astronomy, this was, and probably remains today, certainly the most accurate way that we have of getting the distances to certainly the nearby stars, this fundamental method of using parallax. Um, but we are limited by this fact that as far as um, measurements from the ground are concerned, even with a good telescope, we only have an angular accuracy of an arc second, which really only helps us observe the uh, measure the distance to the very nearest stars. We can try to improve on that a little bit from ground-based observations, but really we need to go to space to improve the, this angular capability much more. I've included here just some of the numbers that explain to you why for a parallax of one arc second, knowing the Earth's sun distance, we can compute the typical kind of distance to the nearby stars. That unit is called the parsec, and it is really the fundamental unit of distance, measurement, distance measurements for astronomy generally, whether we're talking about distances to nearby stars, to this, you know, the length scale of our own galaxy, or the distances to more decent ones, this unit of the parsec, based on this parallax. But parallax, very soon is going to go way beyond just the simple ground-based measurement of telescopes based on the, um, the Earth moving around the Sun. And towards the end of this year, ESA will be launching this so-called Gaia mission, which will use parallax um, to measure the positions of a billion stars with an accuracy of you know, 20 millionths of what we can achieve from the ground. And so that means that literally, instead of being able to measure stars at a typical distance of one parsec from us, three times 10 to the 60 meters, we can go you know, so much more. We can go about the factor of 10 to the five times further away. And so Gaia will actually enable us to get a proper three-dimensional view of the galaxy. We'll actually know for the first time the actual distance between us and a huge number of stars in our galaxy. Um, and it will revolutionize our knowledge of galactic structure because not only will we know the distance, but we'll be able to measure the velocities as well as some of these stars by m measuring their position on the sky very accurately. And we can combine that with the Doppler shift, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes too, um, to measure their, velo their radial velocity. And so we can not only get their positions from us very accurately, but we can measure their velocities as well in space. And so we'll be able to say an awful lot more about how our own galaxy formed, and from that, how other galaxies um, were created as well. And so this, it's a, it's a very simple type of measurement, but it's of absolutely crucial importance to astronomy generally, and Gaia will set to kind of revolutionize the application of this idea of parallax, parallax in, in years to come. So it will give us, as I said, a proper three-dimensional measurement of, of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and beyond. It'll even have applications for even more distant galaxies too. Of course, knowing the distance from this idea of parallax is absolutely critical for astronomy because um, just from a, a, an ordinary two kind of dimensional image of the sky, we really have no idea what the distance is to any, to any star we observe directly. A star, any given star may, observe, may appear to be faint because it's intrinsically uh, low luminosity and very near, or maybe it's very, very bright and very far away. Okay? From a direct image of the sky, we really don't know many fundamental numbers that we need to if we're to get a proper understanding of stars or galaxies or black holes or whatever the case may be. To do that, we really need their distance. And that's why parallax, for example, is so important. Because if we can measure the intensity of a star um, in so many joules per second per, per square meter, um, in fact, that should be watts per square meter, ooh, um, and if we, um, if we have measured the, the distance from this idea of parallax, then of course we can compute the luminosity, the intrinsic brightness of the star, the number of watts that it's actually generating. And without that number, it's very, very difficult to understand. We're really in no position to understand the physics of how anything works um, in astronomy, 
whether it's the brightness of a star, the luminosity of a galaxy, the high energy emission from a black hole, etc. We have to have the distance, we have to have the luminosity. And parallax is one of the most important ways we have of doing that, at least um, relatively nearby. Now, the other thing that we can do in astronomy um, is to try to find objects whose luminosity we know already. Okay? So a type of object, a type of a star or, or something else, that we know has an intrinsic luminosity of so many watts, let's say. Because if we know that, then we can go back to our expression again and measure the intensity with a telescope. And if we know that and that, then we can calculate the, the distance um, directly. Now, these objects are a kind of a holy grail. Finding these things are very much a, a holy grail um, in astronomy, these so-called standard candles. And there are only a very small number of them. That, that, we're, that, um, that we use. One is a type of pulsating star called the sea feed variable, and the other, of particular importance for cosmological study, are a particular type of supernova explosions, uh, a type of supernova explosion. And in both cases, in the case of the pulsating star, by, by observing it to pulsate in a certain way, we can figure out what its intrinsic luminosity is. And in the case of the supernova explosions, by looking for a particular type of supernova explosion, it turns out that magically nature provides us with a, with a standard candle, with a supernova explosion of a, for which the most of these supernova have a particular luminosity with a relatively small error of maybe 20 or 30 percent or so. And that's enough for us to use these supernovae to get the distance to even the furthest galaxies, to extremely distant galaxies um, in the universe. And they have played an absolutely crucial role in setting the cosmological distance scale, these, um, these special supernovae, which are actually due to um, white dwarf stars that explode. I don't have time to go into why, but that was an image of one. So <clears throat> using these exploding supernovae, for example, we can get a sense of the scale of the universe, um, <clears throat> and certainly the distance between, between galaxies. The second important thing that we need to do to understand the cosmology of the universe is to measure the velocity to these galaxies, of these galaxies. And of course, we can do that using the Doppler shift. So this is the Doppler shift as in the leaving syllabus. And if you rearrange it slightly, you can get an expression that's of much more use, uh, much easier to use as far as astronomy is concerned. For example, delta lambda over lambda is the velocity divided by c. And of course, delta lambda can be measured relatively easily using a spectrograph. So just as the students would uh, um, measure the spectrum um, in a lab <coughs> using the absorption lines of a, of a gas, we can do the same thing. We can get the spectra of stars and distant galaxies. And we, you know, there, there will be particular positions of the absorption lines uh, expected for particular elements. And we can see maybe in one spectrum if the object is traveling away from us, it might be red shifted and it's traveling towards us, it might be blue shifted, and you can see how easy um, the, the, the shift is to measure. And you've got a certain delta lambda there that you can measure in so many nanometers, and that immediately gives you the velocity of the star or the galaxy um, relative to us. And of course, and I'll just go through this um, relatively quickly, um, Hubble and Slifer and uh, other colleagues as well um, combined this information to produce uh, this this um, kind of revolutionary diagram, despite the relatively large errors at the time, of the velocity of um, galaxies um, as a function of their distance from us. And we can improve on that very much by using these um, supernovae. And you can see that there is this remarkably linear looking relationship between these two quantities. And this, of course, is the famous Hubble law. And <coughs> probably the most um, important measurement, certainly early measurement, of um, um, describing the, um, the cosmos in general. From it, we can conclude a variety of things. The universe is expanding. The more distant the galaxy is, on average, the faster it's receding from us. There must have been a time in the past when you can extrapolate everything down to zero, the so-called Big Bang. Um, and furthermore, by measuring the slope of that diagram, um, you actually get an estimate for the age of the universe. Um, I mightn't have time. I have a slide here that describes that. Um, basically, uh, the, because there's a linear relationship between the velocity of the galaxy as it recedes from us and its distance, 
we can represent that with this, this constant, the whole so-called Hubble constant. But if you think, on the other hand, well, supposing those galaxies have been moving away for a time t, then their distance from us must equal their, let's say, average velocity times t. And so if you combine this expression, simple you know, expression for distance equals speed multiplied by time, with this expression, which we've measured from our Hubble diagram, you should be able to convince yourself that t, the time over which the galaxies have been moving away since the beginning of the universe, is of order 1 over the Hubble constant. And so the slope of that diagram, which we've got just by being able to measure the distance to, to galaxies and their velocity from the Doppler shift, gives us an estimate of the age of the universe. And so this is one of the reasons why it's been of such importance to us. So that was the first kind of quick tour of uh, measuring the distance to galaxies, um, starting, well, the distance to objects, starting off using um, cosmology, uh, using parallax, and then um, this idea of the Doppler shift as well. I'm going to quickly go through two other um, topics. One is a relatively new one over the last uh, maybe 10 or 20 years in astronomy, and the, the wonderful fact that we actually have been able to measure, the, uh, to determine the existence of planets around other stars. If you were talking to an astronomer maybe 25 years ago and said that in 20 years' time, 25 years' time, we would know of 500, 600 or more planets orbiting other stars, they would have laughed at you. Because technically, at least in theory at least, it's, it's a, an extremely difficult thing to do. Primarily because stars, of course, are generally so much brighter than the planets that orbit them. Planets don't generate their own energy uh, of an, in any significant amount. And so any light that you see from the planets in the, the night sky, for example, is reflected light from those planets uh, because of the light from the sun. So seeing planets directly is a, a very, very challenging um, um, technically, certainly planets orbiting other stars. But there have been two techniques employed that indeed, though, have shown us that we can infer the presence of these planets, even though we might not be able to image them directly. And the simplest one is this idea of a transit. And so in this case, we have a distant star. And the star is, is so distant that we can't actually see the face of the star directly. Okay? In fact, there, are only, there might be one or two stars in the whole sky that we can actually image the disk of directly. Okay? The, for every other star, it's so far away, we cannot actually create an image of the disk of the star. But imagine for such a star, you could see the disk. As a planet transits across the face of the disk, the planet is essentially a dark disk against it. And so it reduces the overall flux that we see from that star. Now, it reduces it by a very small amount, by only of the order of a percent or so, even for the largest planets. But it's a measurement we can see. And in fact, there was a, an astronomer in Queen's University in Belfast, uh, Don Polacco, who played a key role in uh, measuring such tran transits from the ground um, 10 years ago or so. Um, it, it's kind of easy and difficult. It's easy because these stars are relatively bright stars. Their measurements, they can be made with telescopes that are relatively small. But it's difficult because, on the other hand, the dip that you see, as I said, as the planet transits across the disk of the star, is, rel is very shallow. It's only a few percent. But it can be done with relatively small telescopes. And there are many, many amateur astronomers, and maybe even schools, um, I, I haven't checked into that, who have been able to measure transits themselves directly um, of these planets as they transit across the, the disk of a star. The other thing, of course, is that this has been attempted from space with the famous Kepler mission that unfortunately has recently uh, reached the end of its, uh, its life, this useful lifetime as far as finding planets are concerned. And all of these, much of this data is actually online. And so this is a, a measurement of a star that was observed by this Kepler um, telescope. It was fixed at a certain position in the sky for, uh, I think, at least two years, measuring the brightness of millions of stars. And you can see that every now and again, there's a dip. Now, I don't know about this guy, but here there's a dip, and it recovers again. And here there's a shallower dip, and it recovers again, superimposed on other kind of levels of variation. And you can see that the amplitude of the dip here is only 0 0.006 here, and here it's even shallower again. But the, the beauty of seeing these dips, I suppose that there, there are two things about it. The first thing is, one minute. The first thing is that, is that my 18 minute warning or my 20 minute warning? 
it's my, it's my, it's my absolute warning. Um, the beauty of these dips is that if you measure them, you can actually measure the radius of the planet, okay? Because the depth of the dip depends on nothing more than the, the size of the disk of the planet relative to the size of the disk of the star. So it's just pi r squared divided by pi r squared, okay? And that gives you the dip. So for one of our dips, this fractional variation is 0 0.006. And so 0 0.006 equals this divided by that. The star might be a star like the sun, so you know what this is, our star is. So it's trivial to figure out what the radius of the planet is. So it's magic. You can't see the planet directly, but we can actually measure its radius by finding these transits. And it's such an easy thing to do. Okay? And of course, the smaller the dip, the even more interesting thing it is, because this is kind of boring, because when you work this out, this is maybe the size of Jupiter. But if you get really small dips, you could be getting things that are not, maybe not quite the size of the Earth, but they might be five times the radius of the Earth. Okay? And, and so the smaller the dip is, the more likely it is that the planet could be getting close to the kind of planet that we're really interested in around another star, which is one that could be like the, um, like the Earth. <coughs> the, the other problem there is that, of course, the size of the planet is important, but where it is as it orbits the star is also very important as well. And there are ways of figuring out the distance of the planet from the star, which I don't, get a, don't have a time to go into now, um, but that determines how the degree to which it's being irradiated by its parent star and whether it's warm enough to be a place where there could be life. So we're looking for planets in this habitable or Goldilocks zone. And to compute that, you need one other a little bit of physics based on black body radiation, which I don't think, though, you'd actually do in the leaving cert. I have minus one minute left. And so what I'm going to do is just minus two, minus two minutes left. I don't know if that's better or worse. Um, the third topic, and I guess what's going to happen, um, I'll refer you to the, um, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint presentation that will be online, which is to do with finding dark matter in the universe. And here I actually go through, um, well, firstly, the general one way of finding dark matter is to, to look at galaxies and to measure the speed with which stars orbit around the galaxy. Um, again, it's from nothing more than the Doppler shift. Stars on the right-hand side might be moving away from us. Stars on the left-hand side might be moving towards us. We see a red and a blue shift. And from the Doppler shift, we can measure that velocity. And then, using nothing more than this expression here for the velocity of an object as it orbits around a mass, okay, you can measure v. And if you can measure directly the distance of those stars from the center of the galaxy, you can get the mass of the galaxy directly, just using that expression and nothing more, okay? Aside from this measurement of velocity using the Doppler shift. And so this way gives you the amount of gravitating mass in a galaxy like that. And you can compare it to its brightness. Okay, in this case, the measure brightness might be five times 10 to the 10 solar luminosities. And by comparing, and I'll finish up with this, by comparing the, um, and these, this is just a numerical calculation which I'll put online, which, which every student should be able to do. Okay? And the bottom line is you can compare the mass of the galaxy that you've measured with the amount of light being radiated from it, the so-called mass to light ratio in solar units relative to the sun. And the number turns out to be 12 in the example I've given you here. Locally in our own galaxy, that number is about one. For the sun, it's one. And so in that sense, for the galaxy example I've given you, there's much more mass, this is the mass to light ratio, there's much more mass in that galaxy relative to the light that it generates in comparison to what we measure locally in our own galaxy, our own Milky Way. And in that sense, this is one of the strongest pieces of information we have for the existence of dark matter, matter that's present in the galaxy that we can infer because of its gravitational effects and other things, but it doesn't radiate. We can't see any radiation from it. And so this is one example of dark matter in the universe, and it's an easy one, again, for students, just from the Doppler shift again, to actually be able to work out for themselves. And um, something I'm sure um, Malcolm Longer will talk a little bit more about dark matter and dark energy in his talk too. So look, to conclude, there are so many things, even with leaving cert physics, that you can use to address many really exciting areas of astronomy, 
There are many resources online as well. We've developed our own transition year course in um, astronomy, so lots of hands-on hands -on experiments and things that the students um, can use. You should check that out as too. And please email me also if you'd like any more information about the use of basic astronomy in your classroom, any other ideas that you'd like your students to try out. There's no end of stuff that can be done in astronomy that can encourage students to do physics um, in the, the leaving search. Um, I'd also say, there's, if you're thinking about getting a telescope, there's a good handout um, just outside by Paul Roach um, about how to choose a telescope for the school. And of course, there is the fantastic Fox telescope tele that you can use online from Hawaii or Australia in the classroom. The students can use them in the classroom for free in real time. And so please check that out too. Okay, and I must stop. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs>